Hello, everyone. This is Hear Her Sports. I'm Elizabeth Emery, and we are back. Back from what I call a late summer break, but this year turned into late summer beginning fall break. I did need a break. I was tired. Of course, it's not news that the past two years have been a lot for everybody. I'll add to that as much as I'm excited and propped up by progress in women's sports. I'm also tired of where we still are in many areas. For me, it's a balancing act between celebrating wins and staying in the fight. An example dear to my heart is the new women's Paris Roubaix. It's just so exciting to have this race now on our calendar. The global cycling network coverage, including the breakaway hosted by Orla Shinaway, was terrific. I loved how excited they all were and how they expressed their excitement as fully as they did. For non-cycling fans, Paris Roubaix is an historic one-day classic ridden over horrendous cobbles. It's often called the Hell of the North. The men's race has been around since 1896, and here we are in 2021 with the first ever women's Paris Roubaix. Again, this is a really big moment for women's cycling. It's a moment we've been waiting for. So yeah, I'm excited. We're all excited and celebrating. And this year in the rainy mud, the racing was epic and one we will remember forever. British rider Lizzie Dignan won after a long solo break, showing her expert bike handling in the awesome and atrocious slippery conditions. I can't say it enough, historic and epic and absolutely a thrill to watch. Let's also look at the other side. As I mentioned, GCN did an outstanding job and gave the event every bit of attention it deserved. However, the coverage started with only 50 kilometers to go, which has nothing to do with GCN, but with the race organizers who create and provide the video feed. At 50K to go, Lizzie was already off the front, so a pivotal moment was missed by all of us TV fans. Of course, because they always are, the race was much shorter than the men's race, which is not universally seen as a bad thing. I'm actually not a huge fan of the super long men's races, but in this case would like the women's Paris-Roubaix to be longer than this year's 116 kilometers. Now let's get on to something really meaty. The women's prize money was absurd in comparison to the men's. Lizzie earned 1,535 euros for winning. The male winner took home 30,000 euros. Just so we're really hearing those numbers, 30,000 is more than 20 times 1,535. The total men's purse was 90,000 euros, while the women's was 7,005. Trek Segafredo, Lizzie's team, will make up the difference in her prize money. Trek has continued to put money in their support of women's cycling, which is incredible. We need more companies like Trek that step up and become partners with those working to improve women's sports. This move by Trek, however, should not let the organizers of Paris-Roubaix off the hook. They did such a good thing launching a women's version of the race and making it such a celebratory event. Why wouldn't they treat it with the respect it deserves top to bottom? I can't help feeling that women get support but are at the same time kicked back a bit. Here you go, but don't get any uppity ideas and remember who has the power. There are examples like this in all the sports, including the abuse scandals that are now being investigated in National Women's Soccer League. Look that up if you haven't already heard about it. So yes, I'm tired, over and over, year after year. Don't expect fast change, we're doing what we can. As I said, despite all that, there's always good stuff happening in women's sports. In the WNBA, Chicago Sky and Phoenix Mercury are currently in the finals of a really exciting playoff run. The next game is tomorrow, Friday, October 15th. In Cyclocross, which has done an excellent job at equal media coverage for the men and women, the World Cup racing has started here in the States and will head to Europe at the end of this weekend. I'll call out again the Global Cycling Network as an excellent place to watch. And the COVID compressed marathon season is upon us. In just one of the many stories, Shalane Flanagan is running six world marathon majors in just 42 days, which included running the Chicago Marathon this past Sunday and Boston the day after on Monday. Through all of this good and bad, Hear Her Sports is my way to increase media coverage of female athletes, to introduce listeners to sports and to athletes they want to know more about or don't already know about. My guests are always super generous and share their stories of how they got to where they are. Lessons that are applicable to our own sporty adventures and our lives outside sport. If you like what you hear on the show, you can support us in a couple of ways. Tell your friends we absolutely love referrals because expanding listenership is super important. You can also support us with real cash money via Patreon. Patreon helps cover production and hosting costs and Patreons at the $5 level and above get special patron-only monthly content. 
Alrighty then, now on to this week's show. My guest this week is Morgan Tuck, who has to be one of the nicest people I've talked to. She radiates kindness, and it felt incredibly special to have an opportunity to talk to her. We talk about the injury that ended her WNBA basketball career, transitioning out of pro sports into the business side of things, sports and politics, learning to use your voice, and a bit of post-pro nutrition. Joining me today is Morgan Tuck, the Director of Franchise Development for the Connecticut Sun. It was just this past March when Morgan, a five-year veteran of the WNBA, announced her retirement because her knees were not cooperating. As a player, she saw action in 125 games during her career and made back-to-back WNBA Finals appearances. In 2019, she helped the Sun force a five-game series against Washington in the Finals, and in 2020, she won the championship with the Seattle Storm. Morgan, a forward, was drafted by Connecticut in 2016 as the third overall pick. She spent four seasons with the Sun until 2020 when she was traded to Seattle. She concluded her WNBA career with 642 points, 273 rebounds, and 97 assists. Prior to her time in the league, Morgan helped lead UConn women's basketball to four consecutive national championships. In her senior year, she earned WBCA All-American and AP Second Team All-American honors. And now, in her new role back with the Sun, Morgan, among many other things, oversees the growth of Change Can't Wait, a program developed to create positive change for all marginalized groups with focus on black and brown communities. This will be accomplished through year-round partnerships, advocacy, events, educational initiatives, and player appearances that move to eradicate systematic racism and oppression. Well, Morgan, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Hear Her Sports. It's a real pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You know, I'm hoping that you can set the stage for your new role on the business side of the sun by talking us through the time leading up to your retirement. Because I know that, that you had an injury, and so I'd like to hear about that and sort of what led to your decisions. Yeah, so I've had, um, I mean, since I was 14, I've pretty much had knee problems. That's when I tore my ACL. And then, you know, I had a little bit of knee problems through high school, went to college. I hurt my other knee. We thought it was a, just a bone bruise, but it ended up being some cartilage damage. So I played on that. My freshman year, I was in and out a lot. Um, and then my sophomore year, it was really bothering me. So we did a scope just to see if cleaning it up would do it. It didn't. So then a couple months later, I had uh, what's called an OCH procedure, which is to basically fix the cartilage. So I was out for like eight months. And that really kind of started my knee issues. I mean, it, the surgery was successful. It did help me be able to play. But it caught like I, you know, started with chronic pain. I had to wear a brace a lot. Um, so I was overcompensating. So I made my other knee bad. And so I kind of bounced back and forth. Um, and through my career, I had six knee surgeries. And so it's just been a, a long road of recovery and trying to get my knees in the right space. So I knew going into last season in the bubble, um, that was probably the worst my knees had felt ever. Like I thought they, I was playing through pain before, but this was like another level. But then I got hurt about halfway through the season. I missed half of the season, um, another knee injury, bone bruising, and then after the season, I was like, I'm not going to go overseas. I had already planned not to go because I was going to do whatever I could to get my knees feeling good. And so I had done before the season, I had done a stem cell treatment when I was at home in Virginia. And then I went to Columbia to do another set of stem cell treatments, uh, did like three to four months of rehab. And then when I was about two months out from training camp, I was like, all right, well, I have to, you know, really start ramping it up to, you know, get in shape and see how my knee's going to do. And I ended up having a ton of knee pain. And I was like, what's going on? I've been rehabbing. I felt really strong, like as strong as I'd been. And I found that I had another really bad bone bruise, probably the worst I've ever had. And I would have had to be out for at least eight weeks. But then, you know, I was like, eight weeks would have been training camp. And based off how my knee was feeling, even before that, I just knew like, I could play at a low level, but to play at the level that you need to in the WNBA, I just, I knew I couldn't do that. And so I decided to retire. It was not the easiest decision, but at the same time, it kind of was because I knew I couldn't do it. And it was like mentally, I think that was the most stressful thing in my life. The last few years has been my knee. So I'm like, all right, I have to, I can't keep doing this to myself. So I decided to retire. And then um, once I announced it, probably a week later, um, I got a call from one of the tribal members who I knew from when I played here. 
she told me about this new position that they're creating and if I'd be interested. And I was, and it kind of went off from there. And that's how I ended up here. Well, you know, I want to talk about your injury a little bit more because, you know, you're obviously incredibly athletic and you have these knee issues. Like, how do you sort of, I don't know, synchronize those two things? And does the knee injuries sort of mess with your head a little bit about that? Yeah, it did. You know, I think it, it does when you're, you're questioning your body and if your body's going to hold up. You know, I think from probably after I had that uh, first surgery on my right knee when I was in college, you know, you always question when you come back from a major injury, you've been out for like eight months, you know, you're not sure how you're going to be or if you're going to be the same as you were before. But I think over time, when you continue to have the issues, and even if it's not a surgery, you know, all the different injections and different therapies that you're trying, and it's like, you realize, like, I'm trying everything. It's not responding how I want it to respond, or at least not consistently. So I think that you question your body, and then you're mentally like, oh, this isn't fair, and no one else has these issues, right? You feel bad for yourself. So it's kind of a whole mix of, like, emotions that you feel, and then I think eventually it turned into just being super stressful. Where it was like, I love basketball and it's what I always wanted to do. But I knew like, if I ever practice, I would dread it because I know like I'm going to feel terrible after practice or I'm not going to, when I wake up in the morning, I'm barely going to be able to walk. So stuff like that, where you don't think at, you know, in your early to mid twenties that you're going to have to worry about, you know, being in so much pain after doing something that you love to do. So it created a weird kind of dynamic where I love basketball, but I started to dread having to play basketball because I knew it was going to make me feel the worst that I felt all day. I mean, it seems like now that you're sitting with that feeling pretty well, I mean, you seem calm about it and you know, you're know, yeah. you not crying. <laughs> <laughs> it took a while to get here. I mean, when I was like going, I think deciding and actually like saying out loud, like I told my parents first, like those are the ones I kind of talked it through. And I think it was like, I've known for, I knew for a little while before, like, okay, my knee's getting worse and worse and worse. Like, so it's only a matter of time. Like I saw a bunch of different doctors, but I still had in the back of my mind, like, I'm going to do any and everything to make sure I can play. And so I guess that's the one thing that allows me now to be at peace with it is I feel like I literally tried everything. Like I invested every, in every way to get my knees where I wanted them to be. And they just wouldn't, it just, it just didn't happen. So I think that part helped a little bit. And I would say, you know, I got a ton of support from like my former teammates and coaches and things, even though like my career was a little bit shorter than I would have imagined, but just like all the support and uplift definitely helped that. Do you have advice either for your former self or for other people who are sort of in a similar situation, you know, being an athlete and and struggling with injuries? Yeah. I mean, I think it's at the end of the day, you have to do what's best for yourself. You know, I think, when you play for such a long time and it's like you identify as a as an athlete, you know, identified as a basketball player. And so when you think about even though that day comes for literally everybody that plays sports at some point, but it's really hard when it's like, you know, this is what you've done. You worked your whole life for where you're at. And then I think, too, it was kind of like for me, I kind of felt like I was letting like my family down. Right. Like I've got to play overseas and like I've, I've been blessed enough to allow my family to see the world, like go places that they would have never been to and travel and have a lot of cool experiences. And I was like, well, now that's over. Like now that exciting life and that that difference and that uniqueness of my life, I felt like was over. And I'm like, how does it get any better? You know, because this is your goal that you've been working towards. So I guess I would tell myself that, you know, you just have to do what's best for yourself and for your health at the end of the day, no matter how, what type of athlete you are, whether you played in middle school, high school, college, pro, everyone comes to the day where they can't play anymore. So you just kind of have to prepare as much as you can and do what's best for you. Had you prepared at all for retirement or leaving the sport or anything like that? Not a ton. I mean, I did because I knew I wasn't going overseas. So I did sign up for an internship through the uh, Players Association. So I was doing an internship, so I was trying to get a little bit of, you know, work experience. I was working with the athletic department at University of Mary Washington. And so that was a cool experience. So it kind of lined up well that I was, it's not pro sports, but you're working in an office setting. You know, I think when you're used to your job is going to practice and being on the court, now going to work and sitting at a desk is very different. (laughs) And it takes a lot of time to get used to. I'm still not used to it yet. But so I think that was probably like the most, I mean, the one thing that, I guess I kind of did not really focusing on it, but when I was a freshman in college, Caroline Doty was a fifth year senior 
and we'd have like sponsor events or booster events, things like that. And she would always go and she made me come with her. She was like, Morgan, you're going to come with it. Of course, I didn't want to go. But she was like, it's really important to meet people, right? Like to really focus on like networking and meeting people and being able to talk to people. And I think that's something I've held on to. And so I've just kind of done that through my career. And I think that's helped me quite a bit. Sure. Yeah. And uh, have you found another sport or are you staying physically active? Or or is there anything that's sort of (laughs) filling that role? Yeah, I mean, I definitely have slowed down. Like I'm like, well, I've gained a little bit of weight. And, you know, I mean, I'm happy and I'm like, and like, oh, I don't have to work out. Or if I do work out, it can be like a dance class or like a step, like just different things. I mean, unfortunately, my knee is still terrible and sure. it's it's not going to get any better. And I probably have to have surgeries and things like that. So I don't do anything too crazy. But I think the biggest thing is just, you know, finding other types of exercise that I actually enjoy and that I don't feel like I'm absolutely dying on, I think is nice. And I think so far, Peloton, I think, has been my biggest thing that I've actually enjoyed quite a bit. Oh, that's cool. (laughs) So, yeah, I want to talk about the transition to your new job. And it sounds like the job that you're working on now has just like an incredible number of parts. Yes, it's a lot. So it's like franchise development, but that means so many different things. In my head, I've had to break it down into kind of three main focuses because I was feeling really overwhelmed my first couple of weeks of like, there's so much I have to do or that I could do and it gets a little overwhelming. But the biggest piece I'd say is like the community outreach and community relations and really trying to increase our footprint in Connecticut and then eventually into New England. And then we have like our youth basketball strategy because, you know, we're the only women's professional basketball team in New England. So we're really creating like lifelong fans, like kids and at AAU tournaments. I mean, obviously we focus on girls, but I think it's just all kids, all youth trying to make a footprint there. Another thing, and I don't have to do as much with this yet, but it's like the off-court player development and making Connecticut a really attractive place for players to want to come. Like obviously we're really good, so that helps, but of finding ways to give them different opportunities, whether that's with different sponsors or internships or different connections they can use or, you know, even if it's a a community partner that offers a certain service that they'd be interested in, kind of stuff like that. So those are kind of like the three main things and then it gets crazy from there. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What's been the most exciting thing since you started? And and I just want to remind listeners that you've only been on the job for three months, right? Yeah. Yeah, about three and a half months. And so I'd say so far the, the most exciting thing was On August 28th, we had our Change Can't Wait night because I'm also under that community part. I'm in charge of the social justice initiative that we have, Change Can't Wait. And that was our theme night. And so I just felt like I was kind of responsible for that night, even though it's so many moving parts. Like, there's no way I could have been responsible for all of it. But it was just like such a great atmosphere. Like, it was one of our biggest crowds of the season. You know, one of our goals is to really diversify our fan base. And it was the most diverse crowd that we've had in a long time. And it was just such a good energy. We were able to have some of the community partners I've started to work with. So it was just a cool night to, to have a moment to kind of reflect on, even though I haven't been here that long, but like I really immersed myself in trying to work really hard and do a lot in a short amount of time. So that was a cool night to kind of see it finally taking shape. I do want to talk about that program because it sounds awesome. But first, I want to talk more about that transition that you made from being a player to being on the business side. And, you know, what was that like? And Was it like what you anticipated it would be? I mean, I honestly didn't have a whole lot of expectation around it uh, because I just didn't know much about it. Like, I mean, I majored in business when I was at school, so I've always been interested in the business side of sports. I didn't necessarily know where that would be or how that would be exactly, but I think it's honestly been more enjoyable than I thought. You know, I think that was a big concern of like, okay, well, you're going from a player to a desk job in a sense. And it's like, are you going to be able to do it? And I was like, I think so. I mean, I don't know. I've never done it, you know? So I think it was a big challenge, but it's been really, it's been really nice. You know, it's, it's nice to try something different. You know, you're kind of like starting over and it's weird to be at 27 and you're in your second career. But, you know, I think you realize you can still get a lot of, you know, I guess I would say like, that exciting feeling or that rewarding feeling that it might not be the same as when you're playing, but you can still get it in in a different way, even in a a business type job. And I think it's something for me, it's maybe realize, you know, we can make more opportunities like this or help players now kind of prepare for that transition and give them some different options. So it's not, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not always you have to go and be a coach 
or something like that, like you can still have an impact on basketball in a different way. I mean, you sort of addressed it, but do you feel like you're still in sports or is it so businessy that you feel separated from that? Yeah, no, I definitely still feel like I'm in it. Now, I don't go to practice or anything because I'm like, I've been in enough practices where I'm like, I don't ever enjoy watching practice. <laughs> but I mean, I like we go to the games. I don't travel, luckily. So I just go to the home games. But I still feel like you are. Now, it's not the day to day on the court with a basketball in your hands type involved. But, you know, you're still around the team. And I, I played with half the team here. So like I still I see him all the time. I'm around him all the time. And now it's just it's like, I guess when you're playing, the way I think of it is you use basketball to like directly impact people, right? Like they enjoy watching you play. You bring excitement and entertainment. But then now it's like, I'm just using basketball in a different way to make a bigger impact. And so that's why I think I really enjoy my role that I get to have the community piece because, you know, I feel like I'm using basketball, honestly, in a more impactful way than when I was playing. So if somebody wanted to, because I liked your idea of, you know, coaching isn't the only place to go after you've been an athlete. So, you know, how it sounds like you prepared really well to be in this role that you're in now by, you know, majoring in business, for example. So what else do you think set you up to be really successful in what you're doing? I think just making really good connections. You know, I think I've, I've never been extremely outspoken, but I think from college, they kind of prepared us for what life after basketball would be. You know, if it's how you carry yourself, how you present yourself, being able to, you know, look people in the eye and have a conversation and, you know, kind of market yourself without really marketing yourself. Because at the end of the day, everyone has a brand and that's who they are. And you don't have to like be on social media with a brand, but it's just like when someone you know, that, that first impression, that impact that you make on someone. And I think that's something that I kind of, I mean, my parents kind of drilled it into me and then I got it more in college where, you know, that matters. And so I think that's helped quite a bit where, you know, even though I was an athlete and I was playing, you know, I was never afraid to go to different events and just kind of put myself out there and talk to people and get an idea. So I would say to others that are interested, I think it's, you know, either if it's an internship that you can do or if it's someone that you just send an email or you just reach out and see if they can give you some tips. I think that's always good ways because even if you have, you know, the degree or different things like that, a lot of time it's about connections and it's about who you know and that can help you get a lot farther. How is the Sun set up in terms of mentorship and, you know, do you have a support group there and are they helping you, you know, achieve sort of longer term goals? Yeah, so we're honestly totally revamping our front office. You know, we have Jen Rosati as our new president. We have a new VP, Amy Shear, and especially this summer because Jen was with the Olympic team. So I'd say my mentor in the office was definitely our VP, Amy. She's had 30 plus years in professional sports experience. So I think she's like, to me, she like knows everything. Like she's done this forever. And it's, and even her wife has been in pro sports for like 20 something years. So it's just so much experience and so much you can learn. Um, and she was definitely the one that helped me out quite a bit and really kind of helped me find direction and what I should be doing, what I should be thinking about. And I mean, I'm still new, so I'm still learning. And I think our office is pretty young, like in general, like we have a really young group. So I think one thing that's nice is we're super collaborative. So if there's meetings that maybe you're not, you're not as familiar with something, you can just sit in on the meeting. And that's a good way just to learn a little bit more. And I think that's how a lot of us are. And we really have that open door policy where it's like, if you have a question, like you can literally go and ask anybody. And so I think that's been something where we might not have like a set thing, but we really work as a good group. I like that the two top people that you mentioned are women. Yes, exactly. And that's why I think it's awesome with our team. And what makes it interesting is, you know, we're owned by the Mohegan tribe and like Chief Lynn is a woman. So like their chief is a woman. A lot of their elders and council members are women. And so I think it just trickles down where it's like, this is definitely a women-led organization. And I think it's amazing. That's cool. So let's talk about the Change Can't Wait program. So describe, you know, what exactly it is. And I know that there are four pillars. So maybe talk about those mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So the Change Can't Wait is our social justice initiative. And it's basically to create positive change for marginalized groups in Connecticut and New England with a focus on black and brown lives. And it's basically to eradicate systemic racism and oppression. That's kind of the overarching goal. And then, like you said, we have our four pillars, police reform, civic engagement, health equity, and community advocacy. And so basically, 
all of those, is, it's really like the police reform is the focus is to create, you know, those positive community police relationships. And so when someone sees a police, their a police car, they're not tensing up. They're not afraid. They're not, you know, worried about something bad happening. But no, they're there to protect you. They're a community member. They're here to just make sure everybody is safe. And then to f- focus on also, because one, well, one group they're working with, the Center for Policing Equity, they're nationwide and they work with police departments about trainings. If that's like implicit bias trainings, um, how to handle certain situations where it's maybe more of a mental training and not so much physical. And then for the health equity piece, really just trying to create access so that everyone is getting quality health care, or at least access to quality information. And so our group that we're working with, Vision to Learn, they do amazing things. They just partnered with the state of Connecticut. So they're about to start. They just started actually um, here in East Hartford, I believe. And they go around to schools and they give like free eye exams and screenings. And then they give those kids that need glasses, brand new glasses. They're partnered with Warby Parker. And, you know, it's like it was so cool just to see like their videos of like kids being able to see properly for the first time and realizing how much of an impact that makes on their learning ability. So like stuff like that is super cool. And then the civic engagement is all about like voting, voting rights, voting registration. Obviously, we have like Connecticut, but that's kind of like a nationwide also for the different like voting laws that have been passed in different states. And then community advocacy is kind of the catch all that kind of fits everything that we could do in the community. So that one really is just to, you know, if there's different organizations that have events going on, we attend or we're amplifying and things like that. It's so interesting that a sporting organization has put together this program. Yeah. And so it was Luckily, last, well, it's it's kind of like a good and bad thing because it was started last year in response to like Breonna Taylor's death, George Floyd. So it's like, it's not a good reason why it started, but it's it's good that it did start. And luckily the league has a big push behind social justice initiatives and kind of each team had their own thing. And so this year when I came in, one of my big tasks was to kind of revamp it, make it a little bit more inclusive, a little bit on a bigger scale. And so one thing that we started doing that I think has made a really good impact. We've had good feedback is we started these basketball for free clinics. And so it's kind of tied in. It's, it overlaps with our youth basketball development strategy, but it's also like we're literally going into different communities. Like we had our first one here in Norwich and it's just a totally free clinic right now we're doing girls only and like they get a free ticket to the game. They get a, a brand new WNBA basketball that they get to take home. And it's really just to expose girls to basketball and just get them interested and just give back in some type of way. Finding ways that, you know, even though we are, we're here for basketball and to win and things like that, but we're also, we can make some change at the same time. I always find, I mean, most of my guests are so involved with, you know, sort of where they fit into the history of women's sports. And it sounds like, you know, that, that's the same for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's important. You know, I think when I look when I was younger and, you know, what people did for me through basketball, it's like I think it's I kind of feel obligated, though. Okay, I at least have to give that back because it made such a big difference in my life. Sure. Sure. So as a former player and now in this role, particularly with the change can't wait, you know, what's your perspective of mixing politics and sports? You know, I think it's a flowing thing. You know, I don't have like a it should or shouldn't. I think that depends on the organization, the athlete, how they want to use their voice. But I don't think it should be necessarily separate. You know, I think you don't have to be a politician to speak on politics. You know, I think and it's not telling someone what they should or shouldn't be doing, but you're just stating how you feel and your stance and trying to make change in that way. But I think the one good thing about sports, it's a really unifying thing, whether you speak the same language, same beliefs, all that. It's like if sports brings a lot of people together. And so it's if you can use that same platform to create change for people that maybe their voices aren't heard or they're the ones that are getting forgotten about. I think we should do that. And it's something that I'm glad that, you know, the WBA and especially the Connecticut Sun, like we're all for it. Like we have full backing from the top down. And I think. It's it's something that it gets rough at times, right? Like we get some pushback about things, but you know, at the end of the day, we know what our values are, and and we're really trying to do something positive and create some positivity. And sometimes to get there, you know, you have to do things people don't like, or it makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable. It makes us sometimes feel uncomfortable, but you know, you can't really change if everything just stays the same. So, 
You mentioned using your voice and certainly Hear Her Sports is all about using your voice. You know, and I hate making generalizations, but I think women tend not to be the greatest mm -hmm. at using their voice. How did you learn how to do it? And, you know, like, do you remember when you started speaking up a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I'm technically still learning. Like, it's so new and I've always been one. Like, I, I guess people that know me would never think I'm shy, right? I've never been like a quiet, shy person, but outwardly I have been. And I think... One thing that helped me, honestly, was last year in the bubble, because since all the players were there and there's people that, you know, are like Aneka Gumike who like she uses her voice and she if I had to, if I had to pick like a woman athlete to be a president, I'd pick Neka, Right. Like she's just like she embodies everything that I think a lot of us would inspire to be. And just the way that she was kind of able to unify everybody. And so we were able a lot of us that don't use our voice as much were able to kind of tag along. Right. We just got to. Like, hey, we can do this to get involved. We're going to all be in this picture. So we were able to use our voice in a way without having to speak up. And I think that helped quite a bit of figuring out, you know, using your voice can make an impact and it can have some, you know, make a difference on society in some type of way. And then it was honestly, I was at dinner and this was recent this year. And I was at a dinner and someone had recognized me and wanted to take a picture because played at UConn and they... um brought up eventually from talking like LeBron James and, the, and, you know, him speaking up and saying a lot of things and how they totally disagreed and how we're, you know, the fans go to the games for entertainment and the athletes just focus on playing and being entertainment. And I'm like, I was an athlete. Like I was there. Like just because you're an athlete doesn't mean you're totally separated from the issues that are happening. And especially as black athletes or minority athletes or LGBTQ athletes, Though they're a part of those groups that are having issues and that are being discriminated against. And, you know, it, you can't separate that no matter what your profession is. And so that kind of lit a fire in me a little bit to, to say, you know, athletes are more than just an athlete. They're not just viewed as some type of entertainment that you're watching on TV or watching at a game. It made me want to use my voice a little bit more than I had in the past. I mean, from the outside, the WNBA has been just so impressive to watch you know, of course, because individuals are using their voices, but also, as you talked about, they come together. I mean, you guys are so unified in what you're presenting and, and the, I don't know, the causes that you're interested in. You know, I think yeah, about I think, that Vote Warnick, for example, campaign. Yeah. that was amazing. Yeah. And that's why I think we learned and it, it was just amplified in the bubble that, you know, and we can all have the same message or the same ideas, but if it's in different, if it's 12 different messages, it's hard for people to understand it. But if you're unified in your message, it makes more of an impact. And just like you said, the Vote Warnock, we literally wore t-shirts. Like they just said, Vote Warnock, right? And like most of us, we wouldn't even have anything to do with that election because we're not in Georgia. We didn't live there. We don't vote there, but you know, it made a difference. And it was like, we realized, okay, we can, that was something so simple and it made such a big impact. Yeah, that was really great. Yeah. So the WNBA has a new commissioner as of 2019, a new collective bargaining agreement as of 2020. Like, what are the big issues? This sort of seems like a new era. I mean, what are you thinking about now? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is just growth, of really trying to grow the game. And obviously, I think the bubble, again, it helped with that because that was like the most we had been on national television. So I think way more people started watching. And even with like NCAA, with the women's tournament, it had a lot more engagement. So I think that's really what it's about. It's about growth. It's about players getting paid more. Hopefully, I think it's eventually going to try to compete with overseas, which may or may not happen. It just depends on people's contracts and what they get. But I think it's just such a focus on growing the game and making the WNBA have a big foothold. And it should. It's like, it's time like women's sports are hot. We're pushing it. We're getting more attention. So it's like, as long as we can, we should ride the wave and, you know, push it as big as it can get. So do you have any influence? I am hoping for a Cleveland WNBA team. <laughs> <laughs> I I wish I had some influence. I did. Um, you know, the commissioner, Kathy, she's, she comes around to each team and she gets to talk to the staff. And, you know, so she gives us like maybe some different things that might be going on, but not a, uh, she doesn't really ask our opinion on it, I guess. So we, we don't have that much of a say. <laughs> right. I keep hoping LeBron is going to step in and I know, pay I know. for that an Akron awesome. team. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. So what are you hopeful about? Like five years down the road, what would be great? Uh, you know, I think if we could look out at a game, like right where we're getting close to selling out 
every game. And it's such a diverse crowd. You see all types of people. I think that would be a big telltale sign that we're really pushing on the right track and we're really making some change. And then I think being able to have a footprint in New England. And I don't know if that would happen in five years or not, but since there's no other team, like that when people think of their team, think of women's basketball, they don't just think of UConn, that they also think of the Connecticut Sun. I think that's something that would make a huge difference. Obviously, it's hard to compete with UConn, right? Like it's that's a, a staple in the state and it always will be. But if we can look back and people, you know, view the Connecticut Sun, how they view UConn, I think it'll be special. Speaking of going forward a little bit, the playoffs are coming. What should we watch? We definitely should tune out. I know we play the 28th and the 30th. We don't know who or what time yet, but we know it's at home, the 28th and the 30th. So we're super excited because we um, clinched number one seed. We have the double bye, so we don't have to play in those first two single elimination games, which is tough. When I was uh, playing for the Sun, I believe it was 2017 and 2018, we lost in the second single elimination game to Phoenix both years in a row. So we know, like, if you can get over that hump, it makes it so much easier. So... I'm really, really excited. We just got Alyssa Thomas back. She tore Achilles in January. So she just had her first game back yesterday. And we're just, we're on a 13 game winning streak. Like it's just really good right now. And I'm, I'm really hope we have a game Sunday. We do have our last regular season game Sunday, but we get a nice little break and I'm, I'm really excited to see how we're going to do It's I think this is probably the best team that's been in Connecticut in a long time. Will you be traveling to all those games? No, I won't. Um, Possibly. I think the travel party could get expanded for finals. But I honestly don't mind because when you travel, you kind of lose your days. And so now, like, I get real weekends because I don't play. So I I don't want to I don't want to lose that yet. (laughs) Yeah. Explain, you know, how your lifestyle has changed since you've moved into the business side. Yeah, it's um, it's more routine. And so it's kind of like more of a boring routine, but I love it. It's I think what I especially when I was, you know, playing overseas and then you come back and you're home for like a month or a couple weeks and then you go right back into your season. I think something I had been wanting was some consistency because you're just always living out of suitcase. You're living in this hotel. You're just always on the move. And it sounds exciting and it is for a little bit and then it gets really old. So now that, you know, I get to go home every day, I get to see my dog every day and sleep in the same bed and you know, I could have a Saturday off or plan something ahead of time. Like that, those are the things I think I missed out on. And I know like my sister, she was like, well, just play as long as you can because regular life is boring. And I'm like, but I want regular life so bad. (laughs) So right now I'm enjoying it. It's awesome to be able to have like a routine and some consistency week after week. You know, I can't help but ask about team dynamics. I love talking about team dynamics and sort of, you know, making sure that the team is so much greater than individuals, you know, not everybody can be a star. You know, what have your experiences been being on such great teams and maybe some lesser great teams? Yeah, I mean, it really just depends on the type of people. You know, you can, I've been on teams that most have been pretty good and talented. And, you know, it's, the egos are usually pretty in check. And that kind of starts from the top down, like with your coach, kind of what they allow or don't allow or how they treat players and things like that. But I think a lot of it is just, it depends on the people. You know, I've had teams where, you know, you feel like your sisters and and you're like a family. And, you know, it's even if something is happening, you can criticize each other, you can encourage each other. And it's just kind of a free flowing thing. And then I've had Teams where, you know, there's certain people you just can't get to. Like, if they're in a bad mood, they're in a bad mood the whole day. And there's nothing you could say or nothing you could do. And, you know, I think especially when you're in the pro game, when, you know, more money is involved and things like that, it's like you just have to realize, you know, it's a job. And some people take it as, I'm just doing it for my paycheck. And then some people are doing it because they just love basketball. So I think you see even more of a disparity when you go pro. But at the same time, you realize, you know, everyone's different and you just try as best you can to like be a really good teammate and sometimes it it happens and you know sometimes it just doesn't so you just have to be flexible but I think it's I don't don't know sometimes it can be hard to manage but luckily I mean I've always been a a really like kind of chill low-key person so me personally I never really had to struggle with it from like my end but I think the biggest thing is you just kind of, you learn how to deal with it if you have maybe a difficult teammate or someone that's hard to work with and you just do what you can. What are you taking from your basketball career into this new career? 
it's kind of two things I would say is, you know, you still have to work hard. Like working hard is going to get results. It's just a totally different way of working hard. Like it's not, which I do appreciate. It's not physically hard, you know, but it's just, you know, you put the time in, you do the work and you ask the questions and, you know, you, you get things done. And then something else that I kind of learned, and this was definitely through my injuries, is you have to find joy in the journey. I have like this thing in my, it's this little, I found it at a home goods store. I keep it in my office. And it says, find joy in the journey. And my mom actually found it. And when I saw it, I thought it was perfect. Because when I, you know, I had my injuries, it was like, oh, why does that have to happen to me? Why do I keep getting injured? Why do I keep having this? And it's, you know, it's always like everyone's journey is different. Everyone's path to where they're going to get to is going to be different. And you just have to find the positives in it. And so I kind of taken that even now, even though it's like, you know, I have my teammates and they we, they had a game and they're like, oh, Morgan, come to the beach with us tomorrow. And it was like a Tuesday, right? Because when you're playing, the days of the week don't matter. Your off days and off day. They're like, yeah, come to the beach. And I'm like, I have to go to work tomorrow. Like I have to go to the office. They're like, well, just ask for the day off. And I was like, no, not to go to the beach, you know? So it's like, my friends are still playing. They're still living that lifestyle, but it's like, my journey's different, right? I ended a little bit earlier and I'm on a different path, but like I find the positives in it. And I think that's just, if you do that, it, it makes your journey a little bit more enjoyable. It's so interesting what you're saying, because you know, you have no idea where you're going to end up and what the different yeah. parts of your journey are going to add up to. Literally no idea. And that's the part that kind of sucks. Like if you could like look into that crystal ball and get at least an idea, you'd be like, okay, I can relax a little bit, but I've I've learned if you worry too much, you just stress yourself out and you still don't know. So you might as well try to find something good in it. <laughs> so what have been the greatest challenges? Um, I would say just figuring out kind of my my direction, I would say. You know, when I came in, it's so many things and I was in meetings and listening and they're like, OK, you're going to do this. You're going to have this and you're responsible for this and this. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, I don't even know. Like, sometimes I'll sit at my desk and I'm like, I don't even know where to start. I don't know what to do first. So that's what I think was a challenge of being able to just, you know, work hard, but effectively, you know, not trying to do everything at one time, finding a couple focuses, making some goals, things like that. And it's like you do that when you're playing sports, but in a different way. So I think of figuring out, you know, those like I didn't have necessarily business skills, if I would say, but I did have skills. And it's like, OK, how do you translate those skills into the office setting? And so that was definitely a challenge and figuring it out. And, and I think, honestly, a challenge has been COVID from the community side. That's a big piece of being out in the community. But, you know, with numbers going up and things like that, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. And I think the challenges are starting to mellow out a little bit. So that's good. Well, that's good. <laughs> So what can we expect from you in the future, from Change Can't Wait program, from, you know, your work at the WNBA? Yeah, so we're, we're really trying to, especially with Change Can't Wait, really build it out into kind of some staple programming that we can have year after year. Now we're kind of starting that fundraising piece for the uh, Sun Foundation. So we have some funds that we can move around and financially get involved with some different organizations and make a really big impact. And so that's probably like the next biggest step. Um, but we really want to make Change Can't Wait like a big staple where we, you know, this time of the year we do this, this time of the year we do this, and we're really giving back. And then also allowing some of our fans and fan base to get involved. I've gotten a lot of questions about what can people do and how they can get involved. And, you know, I think not just asking for donations, but, you know, if it's a volunteer opportunity, allowing people to be out in the community for, you know, that face-to-face -face interaction, I think makes a big difference. And then... You know, hopefully I just work my way up. You know, personally, I, I I think my dream would be to be a team president one day and, you know, be able to, you know, lead a team. So who knows? We'll see what happens. That's awesome. <laughs> How about your nutrition? Has that really changed? I expect it has since you've stopped playing. Yeah. So I went through um, bad nutrition, right, of uh, dealing with my retirement and eating everything that was around. And then now I'm <laughs> at least getting back to kind of like, all right. You know, got to get back to like the cleaner eating. You realize as an athlete, you eat a lot more and you need to eat a lot more. So of like finding that balance, but then also realizing like I'm not going to go practice for two hours. So I have to be a little more, you know, cognizant of what I'm putting in my body. But I think that's just, it's kind of like a work in progress. 
but it, it is helpful now that when you're consistently at home, you can cook a lot more. So, you know, it that helps. And I think that's helped quite a bit. Are you a cook? I am. I don't do anything fancy, but I can make sure I feed myself well, that's pretty good. well. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, no problem. See ya. Bye-bye. It is so great to be back, and thank you for being back as well. I so appreciate that. I often tell people that I'm a better person having had all of these conversations with more than 100 incredible athletes. I so hope you are finding the same motivation and energy for your own sporting adventures and your regular life by listening to the show. It was great to have Morgan talk about how one leads into the other. The most important thing about this podcast is for more people, more women to hear these stories told by the guests on the show. So please tell your friends, colleagues, and training partners about episodes you like. We have lots of great shows coming up, so make sure to subscribe for free to hear her sports on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, bye-bye.